Good evening. And welcome. Thank you. I have a long way to go. Uh, but we have a new director now, too, so that's all right. So our new director is Tom Campbell, as you know. He's been at the Post for three and a half years, and I'm brand new as well. I'm Mike Hearn, and I've just begun uh, as of last July to be the new head of the Asian Art Department. And it's been an exciting first year for me. Uh, we've been able to host a series of special exhibitions in the Chinese painting galleries. Uh, last fall, we had the Art of Descent, 17th century uh, masterpieces of the late Ming and early Qing dynasty from a Hong Kong collection. Uh, in the uh, winter months, we've had a, one, our first one-man show, first one-man retrospective of a 20th century artist, Fu Bao Shi, which just closed uh, last month. And this month, we are privileged to host from the British Museum an extraordinary exhibition, the printed image uh, in China, prints from the 8th to the 21st centuries. And uh, we're very privileged indeed to have the author of the catalog and the curator for the exhibition, Clarissa Von Spee, with us to tell us a little bit about the collection. I must say, when I saw the exhibit uh, that Clarissa curated two years ago now in London, I was so impressed by the fact that the Metropolitan Museum has nothing like this in its collections. We have a wonderful drawings and prints department uh, that has no Asian material, uh, at all down to the, actually that's not true, we have some of these uh, Qing engravings that uh, are also in uh, this exhibition, uh, but because they were printed and engraved in France in the 18th century. But uh, the Chinese, uh, Japanese uh, materials at the Met are actually, we have a good deal of Japanese ukiyo-e prints, but we have very limited collection of Chinese prints. And what is so impressive about the British Museum's uh, holdings is their encyclopedic nature, how comprehensive they are, and how high a quality they represent in terms of the printed history, the history of printing in China. Uh, not only do they have materials from Dunhuang that came with Oral Stein at the beginning of the 20th century, but they go back to 1750s when Hans Sloan uh, left an important group of woodblock prints that he'd collected before his death in 1753. So these represent some of the most pristine, best preserved examples of woodblock printing in China uh, from the 18th century. In fact, we don't even know how much earlier they might be than 1753, but uh, one of the little prints that we use as a kind of hallmark to the exhibition is a standing door guardian. And if you get up close and look at him, you'll see that all four corners have been torn away and this was pulled off a wall in the 18th century, and this flimsy sheet of paper was saved by the British Museum for 250 years, waiting for Clarissa to discover it and say, <laughs> this is an important print from Sichuan province and there's nothing else like it in the world. Now that to me is an extraordinary tribute to what the British Museum stands for. It has collected uh, consistently, not only do you have uh, the prints from Hans Sloan, you have the finest examples of the Shurjujai, the Ten Bamboo Studio prints, the earliest multi-block colored prints uh, from China around 1633. These are the touchstones for all of the collections to be me measured against. You have this wonderful set of engravings, 36 views of the uh, Summer Palace, uh, engraved on copper plates in China in around 1711 by Matteo Ripa. He took a set of these prints to London in 1724. Lord Burlington showed them to William Kent, and the history of, Chinese, of gardens in England was changed forever. That set of prints is on view. So it's not just that we have uh, extraordinary material, but we have extraordinary history attached to the material. So uh, we are very grateful to uh, the friends of the American friends of the British Museum for helping to sponsor the exhibit particularly pleased that Clarissa can be with us. She is a PhD uh, from Hei University of Heidelberg. She's been working at the British Museum for nearly four years. Uh, she worked on a 20th century artist and collector, Wu Hufan, as her doctoral dissertation. She no sooner arrived at the British Museum than she tackled this extraordinary, uh, what we're talking about here, 1,200 years of prints, a, a group of prints that was begun uh, 
with these early collections in the 18th century, continued by Oral Stein and Anne Farr, a colleague uh, who has left the museum now, but be continued to collect Jap uh, Chinese, sorry, Chinese prints uh, from the war years, from the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, giving the British Museum this extraordinarily comprehensive exhibition. What's more extraordinary about Clarissa is not only has she authored a wonderful catalog, a really a groundbreaking catalog that explains this material, but she's just come to us having opened another exhibition uh, and published yet another catalog on the modern Chinese ink paintings in the British Museum collection. So uh, fresh off the plane from London and having accomplished yet another wonderful catalog, it's my great pleasure to welcome Clarissa Bonsby. Thank you, Mike, for this introduction. After such a wonderful introduction to the print collection, I think I nearly don't have to give a lecture anymore. <laughs> um, uh, good evening. Thank you all for being here and having come to this lecture. It's a great honor to see the exhibition, the printed image in China, here um, on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I would like to thank the American Friends of the British Museum for the support, and in particular, Mike for um, his for the cooperation and his enthusiasm for having the show here in New York and I want to really congratulate you for a very thoughtful and beautifully designed installation. Um, tonight I would like to give you a brief overview uh, about the exhibition, point out some highlights and tell you a bit more about the collecting history of the prints at the British Museum. The exhibition, The Printed Image in China, uh, presents the entire scope of the British Museum Chinese print collection from the late 7th to the 21st centuries. This covers a time span of 1,300 years. However, rather than presenting these prints in a strictly chronological order, it's a major aim of this exhibition to show how printing was, um, how prints were used and how um, printing was used in China in different cultural contexts. And therefore, the exhibition is divided in five sections, each representing a different cultural context. Section one focuses on uh, the invention of printing and the spread of Buddhism. Section two is dedicated to early color printing and shows how prints were used by the elite to Im imitate calligraphy and painting. Section three here in this exhibition is entitled Printing at Court and demonstrates how the Qing emperors in the 18th century used prints to propagate their successful rule and military campaigns. Section four presents popular prints and shows us how the common people in rural areas or some urban centers uh, use prints in their households and for festivals. And finally, the last section is dedicated to China's modern era and um, documents or shows prints of the 20th and 21st centuries. Printing, or oh, let's return to the beginning of printing. Printing and paper making were both invented in China. An essential prerequisite for printing is paper. Paper was successfully manufactured around the third century, and printing developed to our present knowledge around the year 700. China is therefore the nation with the longest print history in the world. There is no doubt that Buddhism was a driving force in the development of printing. Three reasons may be given to explain the interrelation between printing and Buddhism. First, First, uh, Buddhism was a foreign religion. It was introduced from India to China. In order to spread the religion, texts and images were mass produced for wider distribution. The mission to reach a wide audience in a quick and economic way stimulated the development of printing. Buddhism further taught that the reproduction or the reduplication of sacred texts and images helped to accumulate merit and good deeds. This would eventually lead to the escape from the endless circle of birth, death and rebirth and lead to final rebirth in paradise. Finally, there was the belief that miswritten characters or uh, incorrectly drawn sacred images 
loses, <coughs> lose their spiritual power. Printing was therefore a safer way than um, safer way of reduplicating these sacred texts and images than copying by hand. The group of Buddhist prints um, uh, on display here in this e exhibition come from the Silk Road and date from the late 7th to the 10th century. They illustrate this close relationship between printing and Buddhism. The prints were discovered. Um, the prints were discovered at the beginning of the 20th century in a Buddhist cave near the oasis of Dunhuang, northwest of the Gobi Desert. And this is the, um, an image of um, these um, caves. Reportedly, about 42,000 printed or handwritten manuscripts, as well as silk paintings and textiles, were found in the library cave of the former Buddh Buddhist um, monastery. The library cave was sealed around the 11th century. There are several theories um, as to why the, caves, uh, the cave was sealed, um, but uh, this will take me beyond the scope of this paper. Um, a crack in the false wall of this cave um, in near Dunhuang led to the discovery of the hidden library by the Taoist priest Wang Yuan Lu in 1900. The first foreigner on the scene was the Hungarian-born Mark Orelstein, who pa passed through Dunhuang on his second Silk Road ex um, expedition in May 1907. Um, and I show you here, you see to the right, Dunhuang uh, in the northwestern part of um, Gansu province. Um, and Dunhuang is the oasis where the Silk Road splits into a northern route and a southern route uh, uh, along the Taklamakan Desert. Um, Stein came from India, which you see uh, on the right side, and passed the Karakoram Pass, um, went along on the southern Silk Road um, from Khotan to Dunhuang. <coughs> Here he is. Um, Stein negotiated with Wang Yuan Lu to acquire part of the manuscripts and compensated him with money to finance the restoration of the monks' caves. As Stein's expedition was supported by the British Museum and the Indian government, his finds were sent to London, where they were divided between the British Museum, the British Library, and the National Museum in Delhi. Um, among Stein's group of manuscripts was the Diamond Sutra, dated to the year 868, 868. Its frontispiece image, which you see here, is considered the earliest dated woodblock printed image. Although this print could not travel to New York, um, the fine carving and complex composition clearly indicates that in the 9th century, printing had already achieved an advanced level. The prints from Dunhuang on display are mostly monochrome prints, only a few are hand colored. This is a hand scroll with repeated impressions of the same Buddha image that was um, then individually hand colored. So the, the um, Buddha images are st stamped impressions, and these are the earliest um, one among the earliest prints in the exhibition, which we uh, tentatively date to the late seventh century. This exhibition has also a fascinating pair of um, prints of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, that relates in date and in print quality to the Diamond Sutra and, with, um, and is dated to the 9th century, so the Diamond Sutra, which you have seen just before. To the left, um, uh, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara is seen in black and white, and to the right you have a colored version. Both images, if you compare them closely, were impressed from the same woodblock. The one on the right side is hand colored and mounted in blue dyed paper with a woodblock printed um, pattern. For the upper and bottom part, the image and the text, one block was used. Um, image and text are designed in the so-called Shangtu Xiaowen format, which means illustration above, text below, and that's a format that was later was con continued up to the Ming Dynasty. These hand-colored versions lead us to color printing with multiple blocks, a technique which was developed in China at the beginning of the 17th century. With this technique, an image in multiple colors is printed, 
by carving a separate block for each color and impressing each block one after another on a sheet of paper until the image is complete. The British Museum collection has one of the earliest and best color prints that are extant. One group is um, prints from the Ten Bamboo Studio collection of calligraphies and paintings, and that's the one I, sh I show you two prints here. The printing of the Ten Bamboo Studio collection was initiated by the scholar Hu Zhang Yen uh, from uh, Shanghai, uh, Nanjing, at the beginning of the 17th century. Um, I show you here some sheets that are considered by experts to be one of the very first impressions from the original woodblocks, printed around the year 1633. The high quality of the print can be seen in the precise registration of the separate color blocks on the paper. So it was important that each color block was exactly adjusted um, on the paper um, on, on the sheet of paper so that all colors impressions were um, placed correctly. The green color in the bamboo leaf matches exactly its black <coughs> outlines. If you see, if you look at the um, left image. There is no overlap of lines and colors. In addition, color gradations are so subtle as if painted with a brush. This was achieved by brushing concentrated or diluted ink on the wooden block, which was then impressed on the paper. This is a perfect imitation of a painting. The best impressions, uh, went, sorry. The best impressions of this group of prints come from the former collection of Prince Val uh, Vladimir Galitsyn. The Galitsyns had fled their country during the Russian Revolution and eventually settled in London in the 1920s. Prince Vladimir opened an art gallery at Berkeley Street in Berkeley Street, and Queen Mary was supposedly one of his most prominent clients. In um, 1930, some of um, these leaves and some others um, from the Ten Bamboo Studio collection were on display in his gallery and they were then acquired by the British Museum. Another celebrated group of prints, and Mike Hearn has um, mentioned this group, um, with a famous provenance are multicolored prints designed <coughs> by members of the Ding clan in Suzhou. The poem on this sheet to the left is signed, um, written by Mr. Ding from Jinchang, and Jinchang is a district in Suzhou um, where the Ding clan had, the, uh, where they had their printing workshops. Um, Suzhou is um, situated south of uh, Shanghai and was a major printing center in the 17th and 18th century. The workshop there produced prints of the finest quality. These prints here imitate expensive painted album leaves in the style of the painter Yun Shouping, whose family workshop um, successfully produced bird and flower paintings in the same region. The sheets here were probably presented in sets as uh, gifts and conveyed auspicious wishes to the recipient for happiness, long life, uh, wealth, or a successful career. And they were given away probably in sets of four, six, or nine prints. Um, the peony here, for example, on the left side symbolizes beauty and prosperity. Remarkable are the marks of embossing or blind pressed paper uh, to enhance the sumptuous appe appeal of the images even more. You can see this with the um, magnolia flower that is enhanced by a blind pressed paper by embossing or gouffrage and the peony um, is also shows the signs of um, embossing. In some cases, up to 10 wooden blocks were carved and impressed on the paper sheet to achieve the full color range of the image. Um, here is another, um, um, another two sheets from this group. To the right is um, a bird, um, an image of two birds, and I talked about the auspicious wishes that these um, prints um, uh, convey. 
and it has an inscription saying, may joy and happiness accumulate up to your eyebrows. <laughs> so here it's very clearly um, even uh, writ expressed in a written verse. The British Museum owns 28 prints of this type. They are the earliest Chinese prints collected in the British Museum and belonged to the founding father of the museum, Sir Hans Sloan. As a physician and botanist, Sloan acquired the prints for his scientific interest in plants and insects, and not for aesthetic or artistic reasons. When he died in 1753, he offered his vast collection of minerals, plants, insects, antiquities, manuscripts, etc., um, to the British government. His bequest built the founding collections of the British Museum, which was founded in 1753, the Museum of Natural History, which moved out of the British Museum in 1881 and is now in South Kensington, and the British Library um, that moved out in another in um, separate building in 1973. Since Sloan acquired the prints before his death in 1753, we are in the fortunate position to date these prints to the first half of the 18th century. Other prints of this type are um, other prints of this type are in the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris, in the, the Kupferstich Kabinett in Dresden, and in Japan. According to our present knowledge, none of these prints are known to have survived in China. Popular prints form another important part of the British Museum collection. The majority were acquired in the 1980s from the renowned collector of Chinese um, paintings and prints, Jean-Pierre Dubosc. Dubosc had worked for the French Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Beijing in the years 1929 to 1947. He was fluent in Chinese and a pioneer in the field of collecting Ming and Qing dynasty paintings and popular prints. At his time, popular prints were not at all considered worth collecting or studying. Today, they are collected by major museums and occupy a special field of academic studies. Popular prints are single sheet prints in bright colors that were produced all over China throughout the year. Due to the high demand for these prints during the New Year, New Year celebrations, they are also called Nianhua, or New Year prints. To give you an example of how they fit into daily life, I show you here the image of a uh, stove god, who is shown, for his, uh, shown here with his wife and two attendants. The stove god was traditionally pasted above the stove in the kitchen to watch and record family life and the events throughout the year. At the end of the year, during the New Year celebrations, the print was burned in a ritual. The stove god was sent to the Jade Emperor to whom he had to report. The report was believed to determine or influence the fate of the family for the following year. And it is said that in some cases, the lips of the stove god were sometimes pasted with honey in order to manipulate his report. <laughs> the calendar on top of the image gives you the date 1873. Other popular prints depicted door guards, so-called um, door guards or mention. Door guards in military attire were pasted on the two panels of the door that face the street, face outside to the street. Their function was to protect the interior of the house or estate from evil spirits. This pair here is of exceptional high quality. It is finely carved with a lot of detail and vitality and printed in subtle, subdued colors. The fine carving and the color scheme are characteristic of 18th century prints made in Suzhou. And again, there is a belief that faded or torn images lose their power and the prints were replaced by new ones at the end of each year. Now this pair here um, has survived, but it seems that the bottom part have been, uh, was trimmed. 
at some point in history. Um, let's see. These are prints from Yang Liu Qing. There are uh, different uh, production centers, and they're different in the prints are very different in style. The Yang Liu Qing uh, production center was south of Beijing, and they have a very painterly, sumptuous um, style. Now, Mike mentioned this door guard. It comes from uh, it is comes from another print um, popular print production center, Mianzhu, Sichuan province. And this is particularly valuable uh, because, or important for the collection, because it was, again, in the collection of Hans Sloan. And we can date it to, um, to the first half of the 18th century, which is very exceptional for um, uh, popular prints. We now move from the rural areas and urban print production centers to the imperial court. The Manchu emperors of the Qing dynasty used printing for political propaganda to illustrate their successful rule and military campaigns. In the 18th century, Jesuits were employed at court and introduced Western techniques and idea ideas. One of the missionaries at court was Matteo Ripa, who served under the Kangxi Emperor. Shortly before the Emperor's 16th birthday in 1713, the Kangxi Emperor commissioned Matteo Ripa to engrave 36 views of his summer residence in Changde, north of Beijing. It was called um, the Bishu Shandrang, so literally the mountain villa to escape the heat. And it was a huge um, hunting area with lakes and hills and um, many architectural structures. Although printing from copper plates for paper currency was already known in China, Ripa was the first who introduced European copper plate printing to China. Apart from map, maps, he made these engravings from the imperial um, summer residence. So the first engravings he had to make were, were maps for the Kangxi Emperor. When Ripa returned to Europe in 1724, he passed through London. On 12 September 1724, the Daily Post reported that Ripa, together with his Chinese travel companions, had an audience with King George I, and that the young nobles, quote, were granted to kiss the hand of his majesty. Ripa left an album with his copper prints in England, and this is the one we believe is today in the British Museum and which is now on display here in the museum. This album bears a stamp of Chiswick House Library. Uh, since the owner of Chiswick House, uh, the third Earl of Burlington, Richard Boyle, redesigned his garden in the 18th century, there are debates whether or not to, or to what extent these images of in the album may have influenced the new fashion of English landscape gardening. <coughs> in the mid 18th century, Emperor Qianlong, the grandson of the Kangxi Emperor, embarked on a military campaign in East Turkestan from 1755 to 59. His victories did not only expand the Qing Empire, he also celebrated his success with a series of copper prints that depict his victorious battles. <coughs> he first commissioned huge silk paintings of five meters in height and up to eight meters in length to be hung in the Hall of Purple Splendor in the Forbidden City. And these um, battle paintings are today considered lost, but um, this is the Hall of Purple Splendor where um, they were hung. Later the, Je later, the Jesuits were commissioned by the Qianlong Emperor to make reduced drawings of these large-scale wall paintings. These drawings were then sent to Paris to one of the best, or to the, the best engraver in Europe at the time, which was uh, Nicolas Couchon, who made copper plate prints after these drawings. <coughs> and you see two of them here. These 16 copper plates that were engraved in Paris, together with 200 prints from each plate, were then sent to China, 
When they eventually arrived, the Qianlong Emperor was very pleased with the results. And it, um, he later on um, continued making uh, or commissioned um, court artists to um, do more engravings of this series. A rather spectacular object in the exhibition is this fragment of a battle painting. And um, as mentioned before, the battle painting were all considered lost or their whereabouts are unknown. There is only one half of one of these large wall paintings um, of the Battle of Cherman in the ethnographic collection in Hamburg in Germany. Um, And this is the one to the I show you here to the right. This is a, wall, a huge wall painting, and it's only half of a, wall, a, a complete wall painting. And you can see it here on the right. Um, to the right, you have a copper plate print of the entire battle scene. Um, and to the left, there is the painting fragment that depicts a precise detail of the print that you uh, see to the right. And this is, uh, if you have the row of uh, soldiers here, the camels, um, and some mules carrying, uh, I think, pulling some cannons, um, this is exactly the detail um, that you can see on he see here on the you have the row row of soldiers you can see some camels here um, and the two mules can be found here on the print so here you have the uh, to the right the complete battle scene um, from a reduced drawing from a wall painting and to the left is um, a fragment of these wall paintings and this fragment here was only recently identified and it is now uh, for the second time on public display. Now let us turn to modern China. The 20th century was a turbulent period in China and the prince of this time reflects this. Between the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911 and the establishment of the People's Republic of China under Mao Zedong in 1949, China was a republic. The nationalist government, the Kuomintang, was caught in a civil war between the communists on the one hand and the invading Japanese on the other. During the Second World War from 1937 to 1945, China was occupied by Japan. In this period, the modern woodcut movement played an important role. The print here shows the revolutionary uh, writer Lu Xun and Uchiyama Kakichi together. And Lu Xun had invited the Japanese printmaker Uchiyama to give a woodblock printing class in Shanghai in 1931. And this print commemorates this event. This event, this woodblock printing class in 1931 in Shanghai, is considered the birth of the modern woodcut movement. Lu Xun um, invited uh, about nine um, print makers, print artists or, or artists, to um, take this class with um, Uchiyama. And he himself collected prints by Franz Mazarel, Käthe Kollwitz, as well as those by modern Japanese printmakers and Soviet printmakers, and uh, introduced these collections to um, the Chinese printmakers. Although Lu Xun himself was not a printmaker, he saw the print as an ideal medium and artistic form to express China's need for social and political change. <coughs> Artists who worked in this medium were often involved in left-wing activities, and some of them suffered uh, severe persecution, even death under the Kuomintang. During the Japanese war, modern printmakers had to decide either to join the, communist, uh, the communists and depart to the remote headquarters quarters of the Red Army into the northwest of China, to Yan'an, um, or to be active in the areas controlled by the nationalist government. And uh, this print here is one by Luo Gongliu, who joined the communist 
to their base in Yan'an. Print printmakers in the communist-controlled areas were encouraged to use the vis visual language of popular prints and paper cuts, as this was familiar to the rural population. And they were also encouraged to show the positive aspects of life under communism. Um, this print here uses red color and the pictorial language of a traditional paper cut. It shows a peasant who practices, practices modern hygiene. The print was <coughs> produced to promote an educational campaign uh, initiated by the communists in rural areas. And the model peasant who practice, practices modern hygiene here is promised to enjoy long life. Artists in areas controlled by the nationalist government often produced anti-war images and experimented with different artistic means. One example is the last bullet by Huang Yin, done in 1943. The dramatic composition has a cinematic quality and the carved lines are fine and vibrant. It is a masterpiece of monochrome uh, woodblock carving. And it's amazing how he achieved the very fine carving. Uh, if you imagine you have to carve all these, um, you have to achieve all the effects, uh, black and white effects, with only with a knife and um, you carve it out of a um, wooden block. Another touching theme is a print by Liu Lun uh, carved in 1943. It is entitled The Toy Daddy Bought Brought Back from the Front. It shows a soldier who returns to his family and holds a doll in a Japanese kimono in his hand. His youngest child on the shoulder of his wife is longing for the toy, not knowing anything about its previous owner. The two boys below look at the flag showing the Japanese rising sun. Liu Lun incidentally thought all his prints were lost um, when we contacted him and his family and he was delighted to learn that um, this print is in the British Museum and he uh, it thinks that it's probably the only impression that survived from the lost um, block. And this, uh, he also told us a very personal story um, attached to this, um, that we can associate with this print. Um, it is to commemorate the victory of the Chinese army over the Japanese in West Hunan in 1943. And uh, Liu Lun had accompanied the, the soldiers to West Hunan um, during this battle and he carved the image after the return to celebrate um, the victory. And first, when we had the sprint, we, we, before we contacted Liu Lun, Liu Lun and his family, we couldn't date the print, we could only date it to the time of the uh, Sino-Japanese War. Um, but now we can locate, um, precisely say where it was carved and when, in what year it was um, created. Now I'm not talking about, I'm not going to talk about the prints used in the Mao time and during the Cultural Revolution uh, as time is too short. Mao, however, initiated that printmaking departments were established in major art academies in the late 1950s, um, which enhanced the status of the print as an artistic medium. Printmakers under Mao Zedong had to serve the communist propaganda and their images celebrated the positive aspects of communist life. This policy changed after Mao's death when Deng Xiaoping announced economic and political reforms in the 1980s and 90s. This encouraged artists to explore new subjects and techniques while China gradually reopened to the international community. In particular, artists of the art academies in Sichuan, Beijing and Hangzhou uh, were and are still producing works of art that have gained recognition in the international art scene. Wu Jide and the female printmaker Lin Xiang are 
uh, an example, and both were active at the Arc Art Academy um, of, at Hangzhou. Hangzhou is situated um, south of um, Shanghai and is close to Nanjing, where the first color prints in water soluble inks uh, were developed. And in def deference to this tradition, they still work with water soluble ink and explore its artistic potential. If you um, see the, the modern woodcut print artists, they often worked with oil based uh, ink, uh, oil based colors, whereas um, in particular, artists working at the Art Academy in Hangzhou um, refer back to the tradition with um, to the first woodblock printing, um, the first the the color printing tradition, and use uh, water soluble ink. And this is done uh, here in this print by Wu Jide. Um He shows two conversing men in a tea shop that appear like paper cuts. The interior of the shop is suffused with dim light. The artist here shows a masterful control over color gradations and catches um, a typical moment of leisure among the people of, his, um, of the southern, southern region. It has an enormous, uh, it looks li nearly like a, like a painting and it's um, um, great control over color, pr of, over um, printing to achieve the suffused um, light and the look outside on, th on the street. Uh, Lin Xiang's print shows village women in a supermarket who are offered a toy ro robot. It, and it's quite a, it depicts a clash of country women with modern civilization in a rather humorous way. You see these country women standing together and uh, um, amusing themselves about the toy robot which the shop assistant tries to sell to them. I don't think they are going to take it home. Um, it's yeah, it's one of these silly products of the commercially um, of a commercializing world. Um, technically, it is a color graph. Um, Lin used the grain of different woods to modulate the clothing of the figures, and she also attached fabrics to the wooden blocks to create textile impressions of different texture. So you have the grain of the wood, which she uh, takes advantage of for the modeling of the clothing here. You see these are the, the this, this shows the impression shows the grain of the wooden block. And if you look at the clothing here, the texture is achieved by applying textile or fabrics on the wooden block and impress it then on the paper. So she's experimenting with these um, different um, techniques. The youngest artist represented in the exhibition is Yang Yong Liang. His digital print was made in 2007. Yang Yong Liang was born in 1980 and lives in Shanghai. Here his subject is modern cities <coughs> and urbanization, a hot topic in today's China. Yang's black and white landscape looks like two ink or like uh, one, an ink painting in the lyrical style of the 12th century. The format is a round fan. At a closer look, the viewer realizes that he has manipulated photographs. Skyscrapers form the mountains and telegraph poles represent the trees. On a closer examination, the, she's, the scene uh, shows a very inhospitable industrial environment. And I would like to, with this very young artist in the exhibition and the latest um, dated print, I would like to um, um, finish my talk. And in closing, I would like to encourage you to recognize and enjoy the full uh, richness and potential of this uh, art form. I <coughs> would like to encourage you to go and see the exhibition upstairs. Thank you all for your attention.